eye on Ukraine and Venezuela and show your support for the people there. Um, also, the Campus Coordinator Program um, applications are still open. You can uh, perhaps one day be the webinar director just like me. Um, the Campus Coordinator Program is a leadership resource for uh, dedicated student leaders uh, in the fight for liberty. Uh, they equip you with some amazing training, great resources. It's so much fun. You'll meet so many people and you will become a better leader. I can guarantee you that. Um, I would urge you to apply if you're interested in starting new groups uh, that are pro-liberty and um, getting to be on the front lines of a lot of really great activism. Um, so this is the webinar series, and as we've done it before, we're going to have uh, time for questions at the end. Uh, if you look on your uh, GoToWebinar panel, you'll see a box where you can type in questions, and at the end, I will ask those questions to uh, Dr. Palmer. Um, and without further ado, I will introduce him. Uh, Dr. Tom G. Palmer is a member of the SFL Board of Advisors. He's Executive Vice President for International Programs of the Atlas Network, where he oversees global work in dozens of languages and works with hundreds of organizations on behalf of libertarian ideas and policies, and a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, where he directs Cato University. A significantly expanded edition of his book, Realizing Freedom, Libertarian Theory, History, and Practice, will appear in 2014. He is the editor for, uh, of Moral, uh, The Morality of Capitalism, After the Welfare State, and Why Liberty. His next book, On Peace, will appear in 2014. He's published in the popular press, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Spectator of London, Wall Street Journal, uh, Al Hayat, Kai Shing, and many other publications, as well as in scholarly journals and books. He's regularly on the road in Africa, North, Central, and South America, Europe and uh, the Middle East and throughout Asia promoting liberty. Tom, it's great to have you with us tonight. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Zoe. There we go. You should be able to see my screen. And uh, Students for Liberty is a very important project. Uh, it's so impressive, and I am so proud to be affiliated with this organization. Uh, Every month I donate to Students for Liberty, and believe it or not, it feels good to be just a little bit poorer financially, but much richer spiritually, because I know that my money is doing good around the world. The topic we're going to address this evening is actually dealt with in the next book that will be co-published by the Atlas Network and Students for Liberty, and it's about war and peace. Now, if we think about these, uh, let me get my... Uh, issues, uh, the effects are sometimes hard to distinguish. You think about war and natural disasters, sometimes the outcome looks pretty similar. But wars don't just happen. They're not really like tornadoes or lightning or other things. If you want to focus on what war is, what is its distinguishing characteristic, it is organized human violence. That's really what war is about. And when we deal with people, who talk about these issues in very abstract terms about force projection and so on, it's worthwhile bringing it down to the fundamentals. It is organized human violence. It's something that really military people do understand. There's a misunderstanding that somehow people in the military are militarists and that they're all pro-war. This is not true. I recall many years ago a discussion with uh, then retired Rear Admiral Jean Larocque about the military, it's about 30 years ago, and he said, let me just explain, the purpose of the military is to kill the enemy and destroy his ability to harm us. That's what we do, we kill and destroy. We're not very good at building bridges unless you want to go put tanks across them. We're not good at teaching eight-year-olds how to read and write. We're not good at teaching about democracy and the rule of law or legal systems. What we do is we kill people. And when you need to have that done, call on us. But otherwise, don't. That's a frank understanding of real military people about what war entails. But it does more than just destroy lives and hopes and families and wealth and prosperity and all the other things that we Think about in this context the death that is caused, the broken families, the suffering and sorrow. War also destroys something else, and that's liberty. 
liberty is one of the primary casualties of war. The human bodies that are destroyed, but also the human institutions of liberty. War grows the state like nothing else. There is nothing known to grow state power more rapidly or more extensively than war. Randolph Bourne, writing during World War I, summarized it rather well. It is the health of the state. The state grows and thrives on war. It helps to animate people into a collectivistic mode of thinking, what Randolph Bourne called the herd mode, in which we are standing against them. And when that happens, we are more likely to think in collectivistic fashions and to submit to the ministrations of the state. It's also an opportunity to plunder the people. Taxes and spending government powers increase during wars. I think Thomas Paine put it very neatly, as he said, in reviewing the history of the English government's wars and taxes, an observer not blinded by prejudice nor warped by interest would declare that taxes were not raised to carry on wars, but that wars were raised to carry on taxes. In Germany, for many, many years, Germans have continued to pay a special uh, supplementary tax in order to finance the German imperial fleet that was built by Otto von Bismarck. We get these taxes and they never go away. It is an opportunity to grow the state and also to steal the liberties of the people. Just think about uh, contemporary, the so-called war on terror, which has been used to authorize and justify astonishing snooping. I recall watching a movie uh, some years ago with Gene Hackman. And it seemed kind of over the top. The CIA was spying on everyone. They were collecting data. I wasn't that impressed by the movie, but now I find out it's largely true that the spying apparatus was much greater than had been admitted to prior to that time. And of course, things such as the uniting and strengthening, strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorists, that spells USA Patriot. The USA Patriot Act, which brought about a staggering increase in surveillance powers and really arbitrary and illegal powers on the part of state authorities. I debated this question some years ago uh, with William Crystal, and I remember he, him saying, Tom, I don't understand why you're so concerned about this. Uh, most of what's in the Patriot Act that you're objecting to are things that prosecutors have been trying to get for years. And I said, actually, you've just made part of my case against the Patriot Act. The fact is that these new laws are not about protecting us from terrorists. They are tools of government officials because they find that they would like to have, because they find that the rule of law is a hassle and they don't like restrictions on their power to invade people's rights and to subjugate them to their power. So the mere fact that it was a grab bag of things prosecutors had wanted for a long time was, in my opinion, one of the arguments against it. But then, of course, the greatest theft of liberty the so-called selective service system in the United States or military conscription. This is a topic uh, that was very important to me. I worked very hard uh, against uh, military conscription and civilian conscription also. Uh, we almost killed it off the selective service system entirely. Unfortunately, uh, uh, President Reagan was became convinced by his advisors, well, you shouldn't get rid of it because it's somehow a signal to the Soviet Union, which had invaded Afghanistan not too long before. I don't think the Soviets were particularly paying attention to whether the U.S. registered young men or not. It's a terrible shame that we failed to eliminate that system. It is a constant reminder of the belief that young men are the property of the state and that they do not have legitimate rights over their own lives. Indeed, this fear of war, standing armies, and executive power was a very important part of the American Enlightenment. And in the book uh, that we're bringing out, we have a very fine essay by Professor Robert McDonald of the uh, United States Military Academy at West Point on the American Enlightenment and the attitude of the American Founding Fathers towards war and their attempts to submit 
the military power to the civilian power and to make it much more difficult to commit the country to war. The idea, for instance, that Congress had the power to declare war, which has largely become a dead letter in the United States. The president can commit us to a war virtually on a whim. James Madison was authentically frightened of war. He thought it was the greatest enemy of public liberty. As he said, of all the enemies to public liberty, war is perhaps the most to be dreaded because it comprises and develops the germ of every other. But war, in fact, was once taken for granted. It was a constant. Heraclitus of Ephesus pointed out, war is the father of all and the king of all. And some he shows as gods, others as men, and some he makes slaves and others free. It was believed that the world was formed by war. It was bathed in war, that war was actually a constant in human life, and that all progress was driven by war. This is a, a constant theme of much of uh, philosophy for thousands of years. It was celebrated. The ultra-reactionary Joseph de Maistre, uh, in just chilling passages, referred to war as the habitual state of mankind. Human blood must flow without interruption somewhere or other on the globe. For every nation, peace is only a respite. The actual first anti-war philosophy is fairly recent. Now, one can find, obviously, very important religious and philosophical figures who stood up against the war and called for peace. That's unmistakable. But as a political movement, that stood up for the values of peace. That is a recent movement. And it was known as liberalism, or classical liberalism, or because of the confusion of political language in the United States as libertarianism, drawing on the same root, uh, the Latin word for to be free, as liberalism. And the classical liberals and libertarians articulated a philosophy of peace and cooperation in place of war and strife. Joe, uh, uh, Frederick Bastiat, in a wonderful essay he wrote just in his last year of life, 1849, he gave an address to the youth of France. And he pointed out something very important that distinguished liberalism from other political ideologies. He said of the socialists, although they have a kind of sentimental love of <clears throat> humanity in their hearts, hate flows from their lips. Each of them reserves all his love for the society that he has dreamed of. But the natural society in which it is our lot to live cannot be destroyed soon enough to suit them, so that from its ruins may rise the new Jerusalem. Bastiat noted that collectivists, he said, have found fundamental antagonisms everywhere. And he gave a list of them between property owners and workers, capital and labor, common people and the bourgeoisie, agriculture and industry, farmers and city dwellers, native born and foreigners, producers and consumers, civilization and social order, and as he said, to sum it all up in a single phrase, between personal liberty and our harmonious social order. I think Bastiat was on something very, very important in this regard, and that is to say that libertarians are the only ones who believe that conflict and social and violence are problems to be solved rather than constants of human life that they are things that actually can be reduced with the right institutions, norms, moral exhortations, ways of life, and so on. That conflict is not something to be celebrated. Now, one might think, of course, that who could really be for war? I mean, no one could be for war. It might be some unfortunate thing you have to do. Who could really be for war? No one. Well, you would be wrong about that. In fact, I'd like to introduce you to one of the most influential political thinkers of the last hundred years. His name was Carl Schmitt. He may not be known to many of the listeners in this um, uh, webinar, but in fact, he was one of the most influential writers on politics, possibly who ever lived, but certainly of the last hundred years. His ideas are subtle but they have permeated the thought of the left and the right. <clears throat> His own political career 
is one of the reasons why he's not often openly cited. You'll find him buried in the footnotes, and you can hear the themes that he articulated because he was the foremost juridical thinker and figure of the Third Reich. A bit of an embarrassment to some of his uh, enthusiastic followers who don't like to be identified with that particular state formation. His book, The Concept of the Political, I really recommend reading. It's a chilling book. He understood liberalism and he hated it. He hated libertarian ideas with an absolute passion. He attacked the market, he attacked trade, he attacked property, he attacks the idea of plurality and pluralism. And his definition of the political has become very influential. The specific political distinction can be reduced to that between friend and enemy. An enemy, he says, is not just the person you hate or the person who bothers you or the neighbor who does something unpleasant. Not merely any competitor or just any partner of a conflict in general. Not the private adversary whom one hates. An enemy exists only when, at least potentially, one fighting collectivity of people confronts a similar collectivity. And he's very, very clear about this. It is about the willingness to kill or be killed. Uh, in defense of your collectivity against the enemy collectivity. I've spent a great deal of time digging into the literature of the left and the right on these questions and it uh, feels sometimes like I've been swimming in a sewer because it is so loathsome and disgusting, the open celebration of violence, a struggle, and conflict. Now, it's not only a right-wing phenomenon by any means. It characterizes the collectivist ideologies generally. Uh, Slavo Žižek, some of you may know of him. He's a, not merely a kind of a clown. He is a humorous and clown-like uh, Marxist philosopher. But he also, I think, is really an exemplar of true evil. He is a Schmittian, as many leftist Marxists are. And he distinguishes the, you might say, right Schmittians from the left Schmittians. Uh, for the right, it's, it's the relationship to an external other as the enemy. And he says, this is a way of disavowing the internal struggle which traverses the social body. In contrast to Schmidt, who saw the nation state as at war or always potentially at war with other nation states, he said, in contrast to Schmidt, a leftist position should insist on the unconditional primacy of the inherent antagonism as constitutive of the political. So that political life is inherently characterized by antagonism, by conflict, by struggle, by strife. And these quite naturally devolve into hatred and violence. And this is what the extremes of the left and the right are willing openly to celebrate. Now this view, class struggle, gender struggle, all the isms that characterize much of the left-wing rhetoric, men are, and women have inherently antagonistic relationships, workers and owners, proletariat and bourgeoisie, and so on. But on the right, in the American context, this has also been enormously influential. It has promoted the wars that the United States has engaged in in recent years. William Crystal, through his involvement with Leo Strauss, who was a correspondent with and in many ways rather close to Schmidt, articulated a vision of foreign policy for national greatness and heroism. A true conservatism of the heart ought to emphasize both personal, that's the little the, the nod to the idea of personal responsibility and national responsibility. That was the real catch. Relish the opportunity for national engagement. Embrace the possibility of national greatness and restore a sense of the heroic, which has been sorely lacking from American foreign policy and from American conservatism in recent years. Now, th this influence of that philosophy has been enormously uh, important and the American right wing in justifying going to war, uh, national greatness and heroism and so on. There's a great deal of buyer's regret on the part of people who took that road with them 
but most of them did not understand what was actually at work, the philosophy of the state and statism that was motivating this. And this is one of the topics that I'll be treating uh, in the book in an extended uh, essay on the philosophy of peace versus the philosophy of conflict, that is to say libertarianism versus uh, right and left collectivism. Now this has been called the counter-enlightenment. Uh, that's a term that goes back to Isaiah Berlin. And it's very, very much alive today. Stephen Pinker, in his wonderful book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, notes that the counter-enlightenment rejected the assumption that violence was a problem to be solved. Struggle and bloodshed are inherent in the natural order and cannot be eliminated without draining life of its vitality and subverting the destiny of mankind. Now, to be very clear here, this is not Pinker's own view. This is the view that Pinker rejects. He's describing the view of the counter-enlightenment, and it is very, very much with us to this day. And Professor Pinker has an essay in the book, which I think you will enjoy reading as well, that in fact, we should understand violence as a problem to be solved. And there are institutional and moral and other mechanisms to reduce violence. It's the counter-enlightenment figures whether from the left or the right, who see struggle and conflict of this sort as inherent to human coexistence, and they celebrate it openly. Now, wars are the results of human choices. As I mentioned at the beginning, they don't just happen. People make choices that lead to wars. Now, obviously, those who are attacked may or may not bear responsibility. They're not responsible for being attacked. Perhaps they could have their leaders could have had a better policy, but the ones who initiate the aggression are the ones who made the choice to go to war. And if we can make choices for war, we can also make choices for peace. In my opinion, the choice of war, peace, is the most important choice for lovers of liberty. There are many important issues out there that engage us, uh, issues of a state policy with regard to property rights and the market and freedom of trade and, and burdening business enterprises with horrific regulations. All of those are important. In fact, all of them are impacted by the decision of whether or not to go to war because the state will increase its power across the board if it decides, if a decision is made for war. So that's why I consider war the single most important choice uh, for lovers of liberty. Now we know that there are some key conditions of peace and there are a couple of chapters in the book that deal with this. One by Professor Eric Gartsky of the University of California at San Diego who has done very important work on the free trade peace and on the uh, conditions that tend to predict peaceful relations among, among states. Limited accountable government is one of them. That is to say, a government that can be held accountable to the people, the freedom of speech of the people to be able to criticize it, open and transparent government, a secret cabinet-style government is much more likely to lead to war, active public discussion so that there can be alternative voices raised to criticize this it makes it less likely, not impossible, but less likely that one will be swept up into war hysteria and citizens who challenge the government by voice, vote, and when necessary by civil disobedience to stop uh, governments that are intent on waging war. In addition, very important institutional features, <clears throat> trade, cross-border investment, and travel tend to be robust predictors of peace and are inversely correlated with war. <clears throat> The idea of the free trade peace is a very, very important one. Those who have criticized it usually have not engaged with it. They will say something like the following. Government X and government Y went to war. Prior to the decision for war, there was some trade between them. Therefore, the free trade peace thesis is false. But in fact, trade between countries does not guarantee peace. Nothing is exactly a guarantee. The question is, does it make it more or less likely? And the evidence is very robust that the 19th century free trade liberals were right, <clears throat> that free trade makes war less likely. 
And that is a very good thing. The old saying attributed to Frederick Bastiat, but actually not written by him, so anyone who makes that has made that mistake, please correct yourself. Bastiat did not say this, although the idea is certainly found in Bastiat's writings. When goods cannot cross borders, armies will. It's not just a hope, it's well supported by empirical evidence. Trade creates peace, protectionism is the road to war. And then finally, the philosophy of liberty requires, and this is a very, very important point, the presumption against war. Just as there is a presumption for liberty and a presumption against coercion, there must be a presumption for peace and against war. The presumption of innocence, the presumption of liberty, and the presumption of peace are very important elements of the libertarian philosophy. If a case is to be made for war, it must overcome a remarkably, a very, very large presumption against going to war. Now, and certainly in the case of defensive war, that can be met. If you're going to be overrun by the Nazis or some terrible group, uh, certainly you have a right to defend yourself. But there is a presumption against going to war, and the one who wants to justify going to war has to uh, uh, meet the burden of proof, and it is a very high one. Moreover, there's no undecided on this question. If you are not for war, you have to be against it. It's not the case that you can say, I just don't know, I'm not sure. If you are not positively convinced that it is necessary, then you must be convinced that it is not necessary and one should not do it. Now, some have argued, well, you have to go to war for natural resources. War pays in some sense. Well, certainly it does pay for various special interests who supply material and get war contracts and so on. This is uh, fairly obvious and understood by all. But the question is, does it pay for society as a whole? Many people have argued that it does. Lenin argues that of imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, and of course many of the neoconservatives and advocates of war in the modern day argue that as well. We need war for oil and to secure natural resources and the like. In fact, the libertarian tradition has rejected that from the get-go. It's an empirical question, at least, and the evidence is overwhelming that war is a catastrophe for the warring nation. We do not live in a society in which uh, the Vikings would, would sail out with their boats and then come back with the boats full of treasure that they had stolen from other countries. Wars are not like that anymore. They are a huge burden to the population of the country that has gone to war. Adam Smith pointed out that of the British wars that they had cost a staggering sum. In the last two wars, more than 200 millions have been spent. A new debt of more than 170 million has been contracted over and above all that have been expended for the same purpose in former wars. The interest of this debt, this was a remarkable calculation, the interest of this debt alone is not only greater than the whole extraordinary profit which it ever could be pretended was made by the monopoly of the colony trade, but then the whole value of that trade, or then that whole value of the goods, which on average have been annually exported to the colonies. Really quite astonishing. Just the interest payments was greater than the annual value of all of the goods exported. So it simply was not a winning proposition for the British population as a whole, who had to pay the taxes and suffer under that debt and pay for the interest on the debt occasioned by those policies. The people who were the opponents of imperialism were not, as you would hear told by leftist professors, Karl Marx or the early socialists. This is simply false. It was the free trade liberals, people such as John Bright, Richard Cobden, Frederick Bastiat, Wagner uh, Lichter, and others in the 19th century who stood up for freedom of trade and against war and imperialism. As Bright pointed out, that the whole system of the British Empire and their intrigues and wars abroad, he said, is neither more nor less than a gigantic system of outdoor relief for the aristocracy of Great Britain. 
outdoor relief was the term of the 19th century for welfare, just welfare payments for the aristocracy of Great Britain. The unemployable sons of aristocrats would be sent off to be colonial administrators in Rangoon or New Delhi and exist uh, as administrators for the empire and draw their salaries in that way. A very good book, which I highly recommend, that looks at this issue in great detail, Mammon and the Pursuit of Empire, the Political Economy of British Imperialism, by two very solid economic historians, Davis and Huttenbeck, after examining all of the accounts, the expenditures on the fleets, the expenditure on the soldiers, the expenditures on the administration, and then any conceivable profit that might have been gained. And of course, some people undoubtedly did benefit from these policies. He said the British as a whole certainly did not benefit economically from the empire. On the other hand, individual investors did. That was what we now today call cronyism. People who were able to get the influential and the powerful to award them war contracts, shipbuilding, whatever it might happen to be. They, of course, did benefit, but the taxpaying population did not. They had to pay the taxes and, of course, also send their sons off to die for the British Empire. Well, one might think, well, that's, a, that's in the past. What about now? I mean, do we need war for oil? Uh, the United States has gone to war in the Persian Gulf, in the Middle East, and they talk about oil. Secretary of State James A. Baker in 1990, it's not just a narrow question of the flow of oil from Kuwait and Iraq, rather but a dictator who, acting alone and unchallenged, could strangle the global economic order, determining by fiat whether we all enter recession or even the darkness of a depression. The idea being Saddam Hussein might be able to shut off some of the flow of oil from the Middle East. And so naturally we have to go to war to protect that. This is a theme that you find in American foreign policy consistently. Now the question is, is it true? Is there evidence for that? During the first Gulf War, the Cato Institute commissioned a study by David Henderson, now of the Naval Postgraduate School. So you can find it online if you go to cato.org, in which he uh, quite conclusively showed that the total cost of the military mobilization, the equipment, the salaries, the material, and so on, was much greater a burden than even the worst case scenario of an oil embargo causing a rise in the prices. The fact is, oil is a commodity. It's governed by market prices, market forces. If the price goes up, other things become substitutes, and people adapt to it. You don't have to go to war to gain access to it. And the cost of going to war is substantially greater than any cost from even the worst case scenario of oil embargoes or some hostile power getting access to the oil. We should also remember in this context that the government of Venezuela, Maduro and before him uh, Chavez, is unrelentingly hostile to the United States. It's terrible, nasty things about the U.S. It's a brutal, awful government, and they're constantly attacking the United States. And where do they sell their oil? Well, of course, to American purchasers. It's a commodity, and they're not stupid. So they're selling it to the great Satan, of the United States. William Niskanen, the late uh, chairman of the Cato Institute, was one of the first to make the case against war uh, uh, with Saddam Hussein. Uh, in the second Gulf War, he debated uh, former CIA director James Woolsey. And it's worth watching this debate online. You can find it on C-SPAN or Cato.org, Woolsey and Niskanen debate on war. He said, we have a world market for oil. Oil is not worth the war. It wasn't in 1991, and it is not now. So we don't need, and the vast majority never benefit from, wars for national glory, wars for national prestige, wars to turn us into real men, wars for energy, or even wars to end all wars. What we do need, and what the vast majority do benefit from, is peace. 
freedom of trade, limited government, and the freedom to challenge governmental policies. In short, from liberty. Now, our cause has already made enormous gains over the years. Our arguments can win. They have already changed the world. I do highly recommend this very good book by Steven Pinker, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. It's a rich and interesting book. He's a very serious social scientist. He takes these issues seriously. It's statistically a rich book. He tests out various theses. It's also an open-minded kind of work. Uh, he says when his case is weaker and when it's stronger. It's definitely a book to read and to uh, struggle with to understand his point. But the fundamental thing he discovered is violence has declined over long stretches of time. And as he says, today we may be living in the most peaceable era in our species existence. As he points out, most people don't believe this because when we turn on the television we see war, violence, horrific conflicts in Syria, uh, the street violence in Venezuela, what's being done there by the government against students, and so on. And so we think that the world has become more violent. In fact, it has become much less violent and if we work hard enough and we maintain the right institutions, we may be able to continue that trend. Now, as I mentioned, war is a choice. If you're not for it, you have to be against it. And those who argue for war, the legitimate grounds of their argument are quite narrowly limited to defensive action of some sort or another. There's no middle ground, there's no neutrality on the war question. Governments may be neutral in wars, but citizens should not be neutral on the question of whether or not to go to war. The choice is binary, and the presumption is always and everywhere to be against it. Now, the book that's going to be coming out uh, this coming fall to a campus near you, uh, Atlas and Students for Liberty will be distributing these. Uh, tentative title right now, Peace is a Choice, still open on uh, different titles for the book. Uh, we've got quite a lineup of interesting uh, writers. Uh, each chapter is a standalone, so you can read it on its own. You don't have to read the whole book. It's not a big treatise. Uh, each chapter makes a couple of clear points and defends them so that you'll be better able to defend the case for peace uh, to your, in front of your friends, with your families, and others, and specifically the institutions that promote peace. It also has a few things that might be a little bit unusual. Uh, specifically, it will include uh, some literature. There's lots of economics and social science and history and law and so on. But I think that we also need to engage uh, the arts as well as uh, the sciences and to uh, bring literature to bear. So there's some very important libertarian-oriented poetry in the book as well. I hope you'll order copies and you'll enjoy it and share copies with your friends. Now, I mentioned uh, Frederick Bastiat uh, near the beginning. He was a great uh, peace advocate and supported the freedom of trade uh, and limiting the state's power to wage war and end to colonialism during his time and a reduction of state spending on military uh, expenditures that he felt at the, at the time were threatening to drag the continent into war. He was asked in a speech before the parliament, what was his plan? Everyone has to have a plan. And I think he summarized it uh, rather nicely. He said, liberty within, peace without, this is the entire plan. And that is fundamentally the plan of libertarianism and classical liberalism today. Thank you very much for your attention. And we do have some time for a conversation. I look forward to your thoughts, including any better suggestions for a title for the book. So thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'll open, well, if questions are already open. And uh, so if you guys will send in your questions, I'd be happy to ask them. Uh, while they're coming in, I have a question for you, Tom. Um, 
you've been all over the world um, spreading liberty, uh, speaking. Uh, what what have you seen um, as the effects of war in the places that you've been, and what's been the most moving to you? I've been in war zones and seen some terrible things that I won't describe to you. But I have also seen countries that have suffered from continuous war, and in particular from other countries waging wars in their country. I think of Afghanistan, a beautiful country. It has suffered now 35 years of war, almost, con well, essentially continuous. And the destruction of the infrastructure is horrific. Uh, areas that had once been able to sustain large populations, beautiful orchards that were destroyed, uh, obviously buildings, but also the suffering of the people that had to live through that, those who were not able to get away, was unbearable. One of our friends there, a libertarian in Afghanistan, Professor Ramiz Poor, who's promoting libertarian ideas and works with Students for Liberty groups at Afghan universities, when he was a boy and the communists had taken over the country, he had to go out with his father as the communists were going door to door and examining people's libraries. And if you didn't have the right books or you had the wrong books, they would execute you. So he had to go out with his father when he was a boy and help him feed book one book at a time all of his father and mother's library into the fire. So when the communists came, they wouldn't have any forbidden books. They suffered under the communists, under the war, under the civil war, under the Taliban. He was sentenced to death for teaching uh, the idea that women have equal rights, had to flee the country and then later come back. Uh, astonishingly brave people, but that country has been suffering from wars fought by other powers. Quite frankly, uh, much of it between India and Pakistan uh, fought within uh, uh, Afghanistan, but then also the United States and the Soviet Union prior to that time. So. The ravages of war are very difficult to understand unless you've been in a country that is experiencing it today or has in the past. Thank you, Tom. That, that's really powerful. Um, I have a question from uh, Ross who says, many libertarian academics have referred to the 20th century as the century of total war. And this doesn't seem an outrageous claim, with two world wars and a many decades long Cold War, as well as numerous smaller wars. Is there no tension between these facts and uh, Pinker's claim that we have less violence now than ever? Well, that's an excellent question. And actually, uh, Pinker's smart enough to have thought of that himself, because it is exactly what would occur to any reasonable person. And as he points out, if you look at the data, on violence experienced in the 20th century. It's horrific and staggering, and there are two enormous spikes in the, uh, the death rates and the experience of, of colossal brutality. For World War I and World War II, World War II also encompassing the uh, horrifying Holocaust uh, in, in Central and Eastern Europe. But he says, even taking that into account, the 20th century saw a decline in the experience of violence and warfare. So I recommend going and reading the book. He makes a very strong case uh, that, in fact, the human experience of war and violence diminished. So read the book. Uh, he does deal with all of these questions. It's, it's a, an obvious question to pose. And I think that uh, uh, he does an adequate job. By adequate, I mean convincing that, in fact, even during that time period, uh, the propensity to war declined 
in comparison to previous centuries. There's one more point to be made, and that is that those two wars, World Wars I and II, were, as he pointed out, a kind of counterattack of the counter-enlightenment, a specific, clear, open rejection of liberal ideas. And quite substantially, the alternatives to liberalism in the form of fascism, national socialism, Bolshevism, communism, have been largely discredited, uh, partly because of the brutality of those regimes. So those particular forms of counter-enlightenment thought, although they're very much alive and well on many American college campuses, uh, are not as widespread and do not have the general uh, support that they did at the time. Good, great question, and I do think that Pinker deals with it adequately. Do you believe that people who initiate wars are rational actors? Uh, as Bueno de Mosquita had said, uh, people are always calculating the costs and the benefits of war. Do you agree? Yes. But let me mention the following uh, qualification. It does not follow that they always anticipate all of the consequences. That's a normal feature of human life, uh, that we can't anticipate all of the consequences of the choices that we make. Those consequences in the case of going to war can be really, really, really serious. I do not think that anyone prior to the outbreak of World War I anticipated that it would become the mass slaughterhouse that it in fact became. The general anticipation was this was a very exciting thing. Uh, it's quite chilling, knowing what we know about the history of the war, to see the photos of huge jubilant crowds celebrating the uh, declarations of war in the great cities of Europe. The unanticipated consequence of this was, and here's one of the those little quirks of history, once the Russian government had mobilized its forces, all the various governments mobilized, this was a bit of uh, saber rattling and statement of how ready they were to go to war, most people thought it would end up with some cavalry charges and some bits of land would, in the Balkans would shift from one empire or state to another. Uh, once the Russians had mobilized, it turned out they really couldn't demobilize. Their army was so uh, widespread and not subject to the central control of, say, the German army. At that point, war became really inevitable. And the consequence, that war was a horror. I don't think anyone anticipated prior to that what it was going to turn into. And this, of course, is a common feature of wars. So that the rulers, the decision makers, may be rational. But I think quite often they're inadequately informed about the consequences and the risks that they run. One of the essays in the book by Justin Logan, who was a foreign policy analyst at the Cato Institute, is going to deal with exactly this question. From, uh, from what the asker can tell, you are not uh, completely opposed to um, some sort of national defense policy. Uh, what do you think is the right degree of defense spending or preparation, and what kind of uh, defense would this entail? Uh, if the focus is on the United States, because obviously other countries ha have defensive um, apparatus as well, but if we're thinking about the United States, I think it should be the defense of the United States. So one should start first with what is an appropriate foreign policy, then, what is the appropriate military policy to carry that out? And then, what is the military structure needed to carry out that? One could do that with a much smaller military force than the United States has to do, has today, uh, quite substantially smaller. And in addition, we do not need to have uh, AFRICOM and CENTCOM and all of these military command structures all around the planet. The United States currently maintains military forces in hundreds of countries. This is shocking to many people. It is much more involved militarily in various regions of the world than most people understand. So I'm not anti-military per se. I'm not one of those people who goes around uh, splashing blood on soldiers uh, or anything like that. I think that defense is an acceptable uh, activity. But you have to ask, what is really defense and what is something else. The wars in Iraq uh, uh, and other areas where the United States has, has invaded 
These were optional wars. These were not defensive wars. And in my opinion, the Iraq war was completely unjustified. As I mentioned, there has been some buyer's remorse on the part of some of the people who are enthusiastic about it at the beginning. So it could be much, much, much smaller. The Cato Institute, Chris Preble and others have looked at this question and proposed very substantial and dramatic diminutions in military expenditures and forces to be able to carry out the legitimate foreign policy, defensive foreign policy of a constitutional republic. Certainly one of the tenets of uh, classical liberal thought that I think can find the most, um, the most appeal within the masses, especially of our generation since we've grown up with I hope a so. practically you, constant war. Yeah, as you have grown up, uh, war has been a constant. And I think that is morally shocking and unacceptable. And really, I hope your generation is able to stand up and say, what are we fighting for and why? And to begin to challenge those who think it's just business, take it as business, take it for granted, business as usual, that the US has to have military bases all over the planet. Absolutely. Um, how do you think the pr uh, principles of classical liberalism can be used to help war-torn countries in Africa, where many of uh, those countries already have a defective, uh, in this Asker's opinion, uh, a defective cultural, religious, and political structure? How can they be persuaded to embrace the ideas uh, of liberty, which sometimes seem to oppose their beliefs? Well, let's focus on the political structure. I'm not sure about culture and religion being disastrous. <clears throat> those are different matters. One of the problems of uh, post-colonial Africa was the inheritance of European-style centralized nation-states when, when you did not have European-style nations like France or Germany or Poland or Spain. But in fact, sometimes hundreds of different national groups speaking very different languages, having different cultures and beliefs now are jammed together in one nation state. And the consequence of that was enormous struggle for my group to gain control of the state. And if my group is in control of the state, life is not so bad for me and members of my group. We get all the government jobs. Uh, we get uh, all kinds of benefits and privileges. But for your group, life's going to be pretty hard. You're going to be displaced from your land. You'll have to pay taxes to subsidize us and so on. And so what we saw, uh, and, and are still seeing in, in some countries, is a struggle to control the state. And obviously that takes the, the form often of brutal, brutal violence. But that is a problem of political dysfunction. I don't think it's just entirely culture, and I don't think it's religion. Quite often, cultural and religious distinctions are used as what are called shelling points. They're ways to distinguish the members of different rival gangs so that the conflict isn't really over religion. It's not really about ethnicity. Those are the lines by which we divide the two groups. In Yugoslavia, when they underwent their horrifying civil war, there was a joke that was told at the time, a funny joke about a not funny situation. What was the definition of a Serb, uh, a Croat, and a Bosnian? And the definition is a Serb is a person who does not go to the Orthodox Church. A Croat is someone who does not go to their own Catholic church. And a Bosnian is someone who does not go to the mosque. They weren't really fighting about religion. Those are merely distinguishing or dividing lines between groups that allowed you to identify who's on my team and who's on the other team. So quite often what looked like fights about religion or about ethnicity or other features are in fact uh, cases in which those are the salient features that divide up the conflicting groups. They may be fighting over power, over wealth, and other things rather than over the contents of their respective religions. Now we have a few more questions left, but we only have time for one more. Um, and this is a perhaps a simple, perhaps a complex one. Um, how should libertarians deal with the question of total nuclear disarmament? That's a great question. Um, 
first off, I don't have the answer to every problem, so I want to put make that pretty clear. Uh, but I do think that nuclear disarmament is an imperative. The fact is that uh, nuclear weapons are a real threat to human life. You, unlike other sorts of weapons that can be used in more targeted ways, nuclear weapons inherently kill innocent people. And I think as such they are unjustifiable and there should be a movement to get rid of them. Now in the context of realpolitik, and international uh, negotiations, it's very important for government leaders to come together feeling this, the pressure from their own populations to bring about reductions in the size of their nuclear armament. After the Soviet Union was eliminated, it was a very, very good thing that the United States uh, and the Russian Federation agreed to reduce their numbers of warheads and to supervise the destruction of those warheads. I'd like to see that process continued, and I would like to see it go down to zero nuclear warheads on the planet. So I think this is important and I think that people should make it known. They're not like handguns or uh, rifles or even tanks or artillery. If you use a nuke, it will kill huge numbers of innocent persons. And I think that's unacceptable and immoral. Just conclude with one additional thought. I hope you like the book. I hope you'll share it with your friends. I hope you'll think about the issues. And I also hope that it will be, above all, a stimulus to the Students for Liberty to continue this tradition of supporting peace and freedom and figure out the answers that eluded your elders, a figure out how to create a world truly peaceful and free. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, your talk was wonderful, and I'm sure everyone uh, would agree with me in saying but it's always great to have you here. It's always great to hear you speak for SFL, and we thank you so much for the work that you've done for us. Um, I would also like to thank the Daily Paul Radio, who is uh, broadcasting this webinar right now live. Um, so thank you to them. And Tom, is there any way uh, that the people who did not get their questions answered could reach you? You bet. Send me an email to Tom G. Palmer, all one word, at gmail.com. I'm not Excellent. always that good at answering, and if I miss it after after four or five days, if you don't hear from me, send it again. That's okay. It won't bother me. Wonderful. Um, also, you can hear a recording of this webinar um, in several days. You'll be able to find it on the Students for Liberty website under the webinar archive. Um, Tom, thank you so much again for joining us. It's my pleasure. Have a good night, everyone, and thank you for coming to the webinar.